get through a very uh, tight timeline today, so let's... Uh, before you get started, Jeffrey Moore, I have your dumb CPAS card. <laughs> Come up and get it. Jeffrey Moore. I'll wait. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Uh, let's see. First thing, they have a, another event in this room not very long after ours, so we want to impress the ship staff with how well we can clear this room. So at 4.10, when this show is over, we want this room clear by 4.15, please. So we can do it! Please, please don't linger post-show unless you are buying stuff at the merch table. And besides, at that point, you'll be so goddamn sick of hearing John Roderick talk, you will be begging to leave the room. So that should not be an issue. First, and maybe most important announcement, the ship has added a second Indian lunch. That will be happening on day eight in Chops Grill at noon, and you can sign up at Chops or by calling Chops. I do not know their extension off the top of my head. Hey, there's our lost card. Do you know the extension? Question. That is a very good question. If you are waitlisted, we will find out before the end of this concert uh, whether or not you automatically get put on the, li on the list for the new lunch. I would say uh, I will let the helper monkeys at the back of the room know, so as you leave, ask one of them. That's, that's the number you call. 3035 is the number to call, we are told. Thank you, peanut gallery down front. <laughs> um, let's go through the schedule. Coming up right now is Matt Inman, and then Merlin Mann and John Roderick with Roderick on the line. Tonight at 9 p.m., your favorite and mine, the Fancy Pants Parade by the main pool. Woo! Nothing to say about that? I love the Fancy Pants Parade. <laughs> this week, this year, there will be audio. Yes. <laughs> Or if not, I'll turn it on. Yeah. Or we'll just stand or around the all day. Uh, at 10 o'clock in because Studio B, Jean Grey will be performing. We like it, Acapella. Followed immediately really by the annual, yeah. wonderful, everybody's favorite dance party with DJ David Reese. Yeah. He's already deep into his own head, coming up with his new hot mixes and matchups and meet em ups. No mashups? Things you can dance to this year? That'll be a good change. <laughs> well, now everyone's really excited. <laughs> and then tomorrow we're in St. Martin, 8 until 6, and tomorrow evening here on this stage, Comedy Night with Hari Kondabolu and Rhea Butcher. Rhea Butcher. Special announcement. You want to give a little special announcement uh, for After Comedy Night? Yeah, so After Comedy Night, so you, you all know that I've been working on a new album, or maybe you don't, but I have. So, after the, after the comedy is over, uh, I'm going to play you a couple of tracks. They're not, they're not finished mixes, they're still, they're mostly done, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about them and play them, and you can tell me how much you hate them and love the earlier funnier stuff. <laughs> It's just 12 minutes of him messing up the same riff. Yeah, it's not it's edited, like a yeah, show. It's just like a show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will have some office hours announcements tonight at the Gene Gray concert, but in the interest of giving everybody the maximum enjoyment at this concert with the hard timeline, that is the end of morning announcements. Yeah. So, do you have anything you want to say? Or, uh... Uh, I'm just here as high candy. Okay. <laughs> The last thing I will say, those of you who were not at Magic with the Stars this morning, it was an unbelievable finish. I don't know if I could even just, you thought the Super Bowl ended amazingly and surprisingly. Ask Storm about his 68 goblins that he didn't even have to use to beat Jonathan on the last turn. To be fair, it was really game track event organizer Keith Baker that, that really defeated Jonathan. That's right. And you know what they say, if you come at the king, you best not miss. So congratulations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, here's Jonathan Cole. Well, there's not much to say. He is the oatmeal. He is Matthew Inman. Hey, guys. Uh, like you said, my name is Matthew. I'm the cartoonist and creator of the oatmeal. 
and I have a big fancy talk prepared, um, but I don't feel like you're warm enough for it yet. So uh, what happened was I brought a sketchbook on this trip, and I brought the wrong one. I meant to bring an empty one so I could do illustrations, but I brought a full one. And I was flipping through it, and I found uh, something I drew when I was inebriated, and I got to see it for the first time because I don't remember drawing it. And I have, I have dozens and dozens of sketchbooks all over my house full of things like this. So I thought, let's find some of them, because uh, I have archived some of them on my Instagram account, and sort of walk you through them as a means of getting you warm for my actual talk. So, the one that I discovered yesterday uh, in my sketchbook is this, and I, I think it's either the worst thing I've ever done or the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> it's just a delight. <laughs> Sometimes I write down my thoughts. Um, I'll give you a minute to read that. <laughs> Again, drunk most of the time. But it's so good. This one's cuter, right? Pet two rings are back. So I'm not the only one who does it. I only think it's rhyme. I, it's their word for when you modify a sentence because you don't want it to rhyme. I've been searching for this word for very long. Asparagus bone dragons. Like, I change the word because I don't like it when it rhymes. And this on itself is comedy is okay, but then my readers on Instagram are like, hey, what does that look like? And, uh, I want some. <laughs> also, we're 30 seconds in, that's like two butts already, so... <laughs> This one was just written, and I believe in it fully, fully. Unless you're describing cake or towels, never use that word. It's upsetting. This is how to hug an attractive person. Basically, put your arms around them, hold tight, and try not to get an erection. That's the entire thing. And you can tell the elite are drunken levels, because none of the lines are straight. Like, I mean, my lines are never straight, but this is particularly drunk. Wait, um, so I want to show you so this was, uh, I was working on something, and this, again, I think it's the best thing I've ever done. I don't know, it could be the worst thing. A butt tuba, the phrase. When you spell it backwards, is still a butt tuba. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best palindrome I have ever seen in my entire life. And that's three butts in less than a minute. Okay, this is my actual talk. I just wanted to show you guys some funny stuff before I start prattling about it. I dislike happy people. <laughs> unhappy people. Unhappy people don't interest me. The people I like to meet, and the person that I want to be, and the things that I like to get to know, are things that are right in the middle. Right in the middle. Those types of people. Because when I look at this man or this woman, I think, you know, what's going on in their head? Are they tormented? Are they happy? Are they writing a novel? Are they writing a song? What's going on in that weird little brain of theirs? I want to know. I want to know this person. And not just people, but things. Things in the world. And those are the things that I like to seek out and write about and understand completely. Because they're more interesting to get from them. And I apply that to everything. Like, I tell people, don't try to be a peach and don't try to find peaches. Peaches are delicious. They're sweet. They're whole. They're moist. <laughs> but there's nothing to learn from dog shit either. What you want to be is an ice cream cone or hot dogs. <laughs> Other than ranch dressing, you want to take that hot ranch dog, you want to put it in a sippy cup, and you want to fill it with scotch. <laughs> that's the person you should be. And that's the person you should surround yourself with. Disgusting and horrifying to many, and incredible to few. Ultimately very, very confusing. <laughs> This is our moon. I bought a high-powered telescope a couple years ago and uh, taken to studying the moon and spending a lot of time looking at it, along with uh, planets and stars and things like that. And um, every time I show someone the moon in my scope, they always ask me, what's that crater in the, lower, the, the southern hemisphere? And I didn't know for years. And I would just say, I, I don't know. It looks neat, though, this massive blight upon the moon. It's like a, like a navel sitting down there. Um, so, I want you to take the moon for a minute, 
Just kind of plucking out the sky and put your pants, keep it there for the next 12 minutes. Because now I want to talk about one of my favorite people in the history of people. Um, this is Tycho Brahe. Sometimes pronounced Tycho Brahe. I cannot figure out which one it is. I've talked to astrophysicists, I've talked to people from Denmark, and I can't get a conclusion on it. I've been saying Tycho for years, so just so I don't screw up when I'm talking, I'm going to stick with Tycho. Um, Tycho was born in 1546, <laughs> and uh, he had kind of a rough start from the beginning. At the age of two, he was kidnapped by his uncle. His uncle was a uh, war warship commander who was known for being particularly violent to his crew, and he was also fabulously wealthy. So I feel like Tico's moral compass from the age of two kind of started to bend in a certain direction. <laughs> At the age of 16, he uh, witnessed a, um, a solar eclipse, and uh, from there he was captivated. He was supposed to go to law school, but he decided he wanted to study stars instead, and that's where he went from there. At the age of 17, he had these massive volumes of astronomical tables that he was studying, and he was studying in the night sky, and he found that, according to these tables he had, when um, uh, Jupiter and Saturn were not supposed to be anywhere near each other, and one night when he was observing them, he found that they passed very, very close to each other when they weren't, uh, when they weren't supposed to. Um, that has nothing to do with passing close to each other, it's just the only joke I could come up with regarding the planets. And, He's 17 years old, and he's looking at the stars, plotting them, and the planets, and he's thinking, this book is inaccurate, and this book was 200 years old, operating on ideas that were 1,000 years old, and most 17-year-olds would be like, I have miscalculated, something's wrong with my data, I, I must try again. Not Tico, this was his demeanor, this is what I love about him, I mean, this was kind of his response when that happened. At the age of <laughs> and so he started rigorously trying to disprove the previous star charts that existed and disprove what we'd known previously. Um, and it was mostly through just pure data. He was data mining. Most astronomers at the time preferred just to look at the sky when something was happening. There was a major celestial event, like, uh, like nowadays it would be something like the transit of Venus or something, that's when everybody looks up. Instead, he would meticulously plot the movement every single night, and he developed a massive archive of data. So he was originally just one of the original uh, data gatherers uh, in astronomy. And what he found from all of this data gathering was that the, um, uh, the geocentric model, which was what ex was accepted at the time, was, uh, he found it to be kind of false, and he didn't really subscribe to that, and he had his kind of typical reaction to things. <laughs> And um, the other prevailing theory at the time was the heliocentric model, which was uh, first popularized by Copernicus, but not proven and not really widely accepted, but it was out there. He also looked at this model and he looked at the data and they didn't match up, so he once again had kind of a Tico reaction to that. <laughs> and in proper Brahe fashion, he formed his own theory, which was that um, the sun orbits the Earth, so it's still geocentric, but the planets then orbit the sun. And this was wrong, but it was closer to the data that he had, so it made sense at the time. Furthermore, it kind of provided a step between those who are in, uh, subscribed to the Ptolemaic, the geocentric model, to the model that we have today. It was like a gateway between the two. And he had the evidence to back it up. And this was his response <laughs> to that. This is what he looked like at 17. No hair, huge <laughs> mustache. At the age of 26, he discovered the first supernova. He called it a supernova. The word nova means new, because he thought he was seeing the birth of a star, when in reality a supernova is the the death of the star. And um, what was important about this was it proved to the world that the cosmos were changing, that they were not constant, that things die <laughs> and things are born, and this was a big deal. It's crazy smart, crazy good at mathematics, a brilliant mathematician, an astronomer, very meticulous, very, very dedicated to his work. He invented, built a lot of his own equipment by hand. He constructed a 20-foot tall quadrant to study the stars. Could be calculated to, to, to a, a precision that was not was unheard of at the time. And one of the things that he did that was really impressive was he actually could figure out that starlight, when it passes through Earth's atmosphere, is refracted. So you have to adjust your calculations based on that refraction. And he did all of this with the naked eye. And the telescope wasn't invented until seven years after he was dead. So pretty, pretty remarkable stuff. Uh, and he probably did it while he was drunk, because that was his favorite thing to do ever. <laughs> there needs to be space booze as well, that needs to happen. Um, so yeah, loved to drink, and uh, sometimes he got him in trouble. He was at a wedding reception at one point in his life, and uh, he was dining with his companions at the table, 
And he got in an argument with a man across from him. And the argument was not about a woman or love or a lady. It wasn't about politics. It wasn't even about astronomy. It was about who is better at math. And so the guy across from him is like, Tico, I'm pretty good at math. And Tico's like, fuck you, I'm really good at math. It's like, no, no, I think I'm better. And Tico would stand up belligerently, and he challenged him to a duel in the name of math. <laughs> So they dueled, and Tico was drunk and wasted, and then you read it, and not particularly good with a broadsword, and the result of this fight was he got his nose cut off. Now, most men, with their nose cut off, would give up in life. They would change their temperament. They would lie down and be somebody who's maybe a bit more docile. Not Tico Brahe. The next morning, hung over, he woke up, and he made himself a new nose out of brass, silver, and fucking gold. <laughs> which he wore at all times. Unfortunately, glue at the time was not so great, and there are rumors that I've read that his nose frequently fell off, so he had to carry glue on him to constantly glue his nose shut. So, t typical Tico Brahe action figure might have a broadsword, a map of the stars, and a little fanny pack for his nose glue. <laughs> at the age of 28, the king of Denmark decided that Tico was, uh, he was pretty legit. He was into this guy. He's like, look, buddy, I like you. You're great. I love the science you're doing. Uh, so he gave him 1% of all the wealth in Denmark. So he was literally the 1%, and I'm one of the few people who knows what that word means, but he was literally the 1% of the gross domestic product. And to put that in perspective, our own government doesn't give 1% to the entire NASA program. And they gave it to one drunken guy with a golden hose. Like, that was the extent of it. In the name of science. And not only that, they gave him the money, they gave him his own island, and the money to build a star castle on the island where he could do all of his crazy science stuff. Because he was into alchemy, medicine, mathematics, uh, astronomy, obviously. So he built Uranibor, which was his, his, uh, his, his castle. It was on this island. Two libraries, six towers, labs, brick walls. He had a printing press there. Trapdoor, secret passages in the works, all sorts of cool stuff. His observatory he actually built next to it, and he put it underground because, uh, with obviously, the sextants and quatrains poking up, because uh, the wind, he found, would, would screw up his instruments. And um, I don't know if I mentioned before, but Tico was kind of an a-hole. He was arrogant, and he was not a very good man. So he built a giant dungeon, <laughs> which he used to basically, well, for one, he um, enslaved the island, which at the time, these were townspeople with farmers and they had lives, and he just, he got the island like, you're all slaves now, so welcome to slavery, this is the new thing. And uh, if you don't like slavery, I have a giant dungeon, you're welcome to live there until you're dead. And that's kind of how he operated. Like, and with the printing press, he was actually a poet, he liked to write poetry, it was total garbage, but if you told Tico it was garbage, he was, he was into the dungeon. It was kind of his blanket solution to most problems. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about Jep. Uh, Jep was Tico's court jester. He was a little person. He was a dwarf. Um, he, unfortunately, Tico, uh, Jep lived under Tico's dining room table. That's where he lived. And uh, Tico believed that he could, was clairvoyant. He believed Jep could tell the future. So oftentimes at dinner parties, uh, Jep would sort of pop up and say these prophecies to Tico. And Tico believed every word that this, little, this, this guy said. And, um, you know, if it was like everyone's having a good time at dinner, if Jeff spoke, I was like, everyone shut the fuck up! Jeff has spoken, spoken in the future. The future is, there's a fucking volcano coming. And everybody listened to Tico Brahe. <laughs> Jeff was also Tico's barber. Um, he was given specific instructions never to touch the beard or the mustache. Uh, only the hair. So most photos, of, or most paintings of Tico, you've got this kind of scraggling desk, but then this is just this long, flowing thing. And um, when I got to this point, I actually switched originally to talking about the medical practices at the time, because um, Tico was a respected physician, which at the time was kind of iffy, because there wasn't a lot of really practical medicine. But I found this fact that I, it's not really, it doesn't really pertain to Tico Brahe, but I wanted to talk about it, because I just can't leave it alone. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the, the barbershop pole, which I have here. Uh, this, this came from the Middle Ages, back when a barber and a physician were the same thing. You went to this place, you could get a haircut, you could get medicine, you could, you know, you could get uh, a wound fixed, something like that. And this pole originally was, um, it looked like this because it was a pole where they would bleed people. So 
It was a pole that you would grip with your arm to improve your vascularity so your veins would pop out so they could drain blood from you better. And you grip the pole, the, blood, the red represents the blood, the white represents the gauze, and that's the blood running down the pole. The cylinder at the top was originally used to house razor blades, um, but then they found that leeches were better, so it became a little tin for leeches. And then the bottom was where the blood would drain into. So the next time you see a, a barbershop spinning pole, just think of leeches and blood and agony, you know, like terrible things that the Middle Ages had to offer. Uh, Tico Brahe had a pet who was an 800-pound moose, which he kept in his castle. <laughs> The moose died after it got drunk on beer and fell down the stairs. <laughs> and again, I really need to point out, that's, this isn't me being a hyperbolic comedian, this is the actual history of Tico Brahe. He has a psychic dwarf and a moose living with him. <laughs> um, Tico's death was, was, was perfect, it was just as celebrity as you would expect. Um, eventually, the king of Denmark, which gave him all that wealth to, to you know, uh, build his star castle, died and the castle was taken away from him. All the town people, I think they burned it down right away. It was like two years later they burned the castle down. They, want to know, they don't want to remember Tico Brahe. He eventually moved back to Europe, and, uh, or back to the mainland, and um, he died. There's a couple theories on how it happened. The most prevailing theory is he was at dinner with a king, and the social protocol demanded that unless the king is finished eating or drinking and leaves the table, you're not allowed to stand up first. So Tico was drinking and drinking, getting drunker and drunker, and he had to pee, and the prevailing theory is that his bladder exploded and he died at the table, soaked in beer and, and drunk. That was theory that's been known forever and ever. However, in 1990, they zoomed his corpse and they found, um, well, they found two things. One, they found that uh, traces of copper, or sorry, brass around his nose, which indicated that his gold nose might actually have been mostly made of brass, which is the gold finish. Or maybe he just pulled the nose out, little nose out for his birthday or something. Um, the more interesting thing that they found was they found mercury in his hair, large traces of mercury. So this means one of two things. One, uh, he was self-medicating and drinking mercury and using it to treat ailments, which is very common. Or two, is that he was poisoned. And there's a lot of people that would want to poison Brian. So he was a very, very terrible man. Um, the theory that keeps popping up, which I don't subscribe to, but it's still interesting to think about, is uh, Johannes Kepler was uh, an astronomer who, who followed Tycho. He was his assistant a couple years before Tycho died. And um, when Tycho hired him, he kind of gave him stuff to do, but wouldn't give him the whole, he wouldn't give him all of his data, because he had the most comprehensive uh, compilation of astronomical charts and tables in the history of mankind in his, in his uh, castle. So he put him on what was called the Mars problem, which at the time, astronomers couldn't figure out why at certain points in its orbit, Mars would appear to move backwards. And it had to do with the fact that it travels in an elliptical pattern, or an elliptical shape rather than a perfect sphere. Um, so after Tycho died, uh, Kepler, got access to, or, uh, Kepler got access to all of his data and was able to form uh, Kepler's laws of planetary motion, which kind of laid the groundwork for how our solar system work, moves and kind of the, the basis for modern astrophysics. So um, there's this kind of, you know, mysterious question of did Kepler uh, poison Tycho Brahe? So I look at this man and I think, you know, do I love Tycho Brahe? Do I hate him? Is he incredible? Is he horrible? And I don't think it's either. I think he's right in the middle. I think he's right where he should be. <laughs> so, the moon. That crater. I finally looked it up. Turns out it's called the Tico Crater. And that was probably the best moment I've ever had while learning stuff. Because I've had Tico in my head for years, and I had his crater in my head for months, and the two kind of coalesced into a, uh, a beautiful drunk magic science wizard on the, wizard on the bottom half of our moon. So! Um, I encourage you, while you're on the ship, to go outside tonight, look at the big, beautiful moon bars, and think about it, and try and spot the Tico Crater. Um, or maybe look down below into the deep dark, where there are other things that are glowing and beautiful and bizarre, such as the male and <laughs> Male anglerfish sucks. You're bad at everything. Can't see well. His, his fins don't work well, he swings slowly. Everything's crap. He can't even feed himself. He's starved and worthless. He's not a good fish. His nose is great. He's got a great nose. The only thing, though, that his nose is good at smelling is the pheromones of the female. So, the male angler will spend his entire life searching and wondering and longing. That tied up, twisted feeling you have when you want to be loved, but you can't. And it makes him mad. 
but mostly it makes him despondent. And he wanders the ocean floor. All of them. This animation is too, too slow. It is so incredibly slow. Good enough. Until he finds the female. The female is the, the anglerfish most of you are familiar with. She was in Finding Nemo. She is a big, beautiful organism. It's extreme, a, a case of extreme sexual dramorphism where the males and females differ in size pretty dramatically. She has a glowing orb on the top of her head that draws in prey. She's got jaws that can distend to swallow prey twice her size. She's got this massive chainsaw for her face. Just an incredible organism. So he sees her in love. <laughs> <clears throat> and in the nature of being tied up and twisted and confused about who we love and who we choose, he does something that some of us want to do. He starts nibbling on her. It's kind of a mice and men thing. Like, you just love it. You just want to squeeze the bunny. You know, it's, it's kind of that kind of thing. It's a very... It's a complicated feeling. And that's what he feels. He loves her. <laughs> and as he's chewing on her, something happens in his skin and something happens in her skin. The enzymes start to form this reaction and he begins to fuse into her body. <laughs> and at the end of this, all that's left of the male anglerfish is a pair of gonads. So, to put this in perspective, he spends his entire life suffering, alone in the dark, only to be turned into testicles on the female. And not only that, the female can have as many testicles as she wants. Not just one. You can have the one, two, three, eight testicles. As, as a person who owns a pair of testicles, they're precious. They're like snowflakes. They're all unique. You only get one pair. You don't get eight pairs, you get one. One pair. People say the gateway to the soul is the eyes. I disagree. <laughs> and they're wise. You know, like, I don't care if you're 90 years old or a nine month old, your balls are old and wise. They look old, that's how they come out, and that's how they stay. It's like Benjamin Button, except they don't get younger. And I believe you can see things and tell things from said body part. I went to a psychic recently, and I said, Tell me the future. She said, All right, she said, hold out your hand and I read your palm. I said, No. I said, That's child's play. I want you to read my testicles. And you know what? She did, and she told me the future. The future is, it's fucking volcano coming. <laughs> so once again, I look at this organism and I think, that is the most horrible thing I've ever heard of, but also the most, one of the most incredible things I've ever heard of. How do I feel about this? Do I love this fish? Do I hate this fish? Is it beautiful? Is it ugly? And I don't, I don't think it's either one of those things. I think she is exactly where she needs to be. So I say this to you as we're out here in the cold, dark deep with an ocean above us of, of, of stars and moons and an ocean below us full of, of glowing fish and crazy, dark, wonderful things. Not to try and see it as something perfect or something terrible or good or evil, just see it as a beautiful gray sitting right where it needs to be. <laughs> Thank you very much.